Now, whether you believe in God, a higher power, whether you're an atheist or an agnostic or a seeker, we know that we need to use our learning, our resilience, our creativity to draw each other closer in a, a ways that we have never done before. I'd like to share a reflection with you about the evolving that we can do with these changing times. I've been re-watching the detective show online called Foil's War, set in Britain during World War II. Have any of you seen it? A few, yes. Now in one of the episodes, the people in the police station are doing a raffle, money going to a good cause, and they're all really excited about winning. And this is what the winner gets. A large onion. Now, I was thinking, wow, I had to laugh, thinking that when an onion becomes the item that people are buying tickets for to win in a raffle, just what does it mean when we need to come together and get creative? When we're in the face of things that are short, where there are shortages, like there were during uh, World War II, what is it that we can do evolving as humans in the face of these changing times? During times of great upheaval in society, what helped humans in the very evolution of our species? What kinds of creativity is emerging right now in the face of COVID-19? How can we ground ourselves and each other in the things that are sacred to us, the things that are most important in life? What has helped humans in the evolution of our species has been our ability to learn and to be resilient. In an article that David Price explains that humans have both the energy that we generate through our body to help us survive, what's called somatic adaptation. And we've also learned how to take the energy sources outside of our body, such as fuel from fossil fuels as well as uh, wood using fire and used it to help us survive. That's called extrasomatic adaptation. We're able to do extrasomatic adaptation because we have the ability to learn. Now, learning, this isn't a, a unique to human beings, but we've developed it beyond what any other species has. Learning is an evolutionary response to the pressures of changing circumstances. It helps us to be flexible. We don't just have to rely on our DNA, hoping that the genes that we've inherited will help us allow us to survive. We can learn to act differently through our own brains and experience as well as we learn from one another. Now, extrasomatic adaptation has also led us, however, to using huge amounts of the Earth's stored organic energy. We can, as humans, survive the cold. We can create clothing, be safer in our habitats, produce and consume high density food. We also, because of fire, wood, and then hundreds of thousands of years later, using coil, coal, petroleum, natural gas, and our innovations in technology in the last 300 years, it's meant that we have created more resources which have allowed human population to actually explode in size. Now, at some point in the rate we're going, we'll likely exceed our resources and there will be decline. With increased human population has come denser habitation. This has unfortunately also allowed the quick spread of disease. David Price notes that smallpox and measles were apparently actually unknown on earth until the second and third century of the common era. 
where they then devastated the population of the Mediterranean. In the 14th century, where there was a larger and even denser population in both Europe and China, it, they provided a hospitable niche, unfortunately, for the Black Death, the plague. Now, human actions have had, as we know, an impact on the earth affecting its health. This last Wednesday, April the 22nd, was the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. I got to wondering what's the impact of the pandemic on climate change? The United Nations World Meteorological Organization announced this week that their climate monitoring programs has recorded a reduction in key pollutants and improvements in the air quality as the result of the industrial downturn during the pandemic. The General Secretary of the World Meteorological Organization, General the, the Pateri Tala said, we estimate that there's going to be a, at least a 6% drop of the carbon emissions this year because of the lack of emissions of transportation and from industrial energy production. But of course, he said that that drop would be temporary only unless we change our practices. Otherwise, it will just go back to the same level that we've been doing. He says, it's time to flatten the curve on climate change as well. He calls on governments to create what he calls recovery stimulus packages that help the economy to grow back, but grow back in a greener way. We know that there are other ways to take our extra somatic adaptation skills in green energy. So how do we take that ability to learn and adapt and advocate to our governments now to put in place the kind of programs for recovery that will counter climate change? We have time on our hands, at least some of us do. What could we be doing with that time for the healing of our earth? We humans are able to learn and we're resilient. I wanna say thanks to June, Jane Shoemaker for an article that she sent me by Rabbi, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs called, The Shared Hell of World War II Changed Britain for the Better. Coronavirus will do the same. Now he reminds us that it was actually due to the economic crash of 1929 and the depression of the 1930s, followed by World War II, that many Western nations developed the welfare state, that system of social insurance for everyone, regardless of age or income, that improved access to healthcare, education, improved labor relations, and also support for those who were disabled or unemployed. Now, these crises led to a more compassionate and supportive society. Now, in the pandemic, governments have, of all levels, have been stepping up to support those in need. How can we retain the good that those programs are bringing to people, to individuals, families, and societies. For example, is it time for us to look at having an ongoing guaranteed minimum wage in Canada? Is it time to ask our governments to put these programs into effect in the long term for the well being of all? Now that's at the society level, learning to adapt. At the level of individuals, how do we learn, use our ability to learn, be resilient, to support ourselves and our families? I was reading an interesting article by Dr. Ann Mastin, who spent her career looking at resilience. And she said that human beings, of course, are prepared to develop resilience in the sense that as a species, we have a long history 
of biological and cultural evolution. It's equipped us with tremendous potential for resilience. But we all have to develop and have that potential nurtured. That comes from a capacity that we have as humans that's both part of our heritage as well as what we learn through experience and education and good nurturing within our families and within community. I thought it was interesting that she pointed out that part of the development of a healthy immune system actually is to be exposed to some challenges. Now, we certainly are experiencing challenge now, some of us more than others. She points out that our capacity for handling challenges, of course, changes from day to day, moment to moment. You can, she said, simply get exhausted and overwhelmed. And then we need to step back and try to replenish and restore our capacity. She says, I have a colleague and friend who's a retired surgeon who talks about this in terms of a resilience bank account that we all store up resilience, but under dire circumstances, we use up that capacity and it can get depleted. He likes to recommend practices ranging from mindfulness or gratitude practices to other habits of health and well-being. Of course, like getting enough sleep, eating well, staying in touch with people that you care about, all in an effort to try and keep your stores, your, your bank account of resilience full as needed. So whether you use the kinds of practices he mentioned or others, they're important for your resilience. Dr. Mastin also points out how important it is for us to notice how we're feeling. When we're feeling anxious, feel fearful, overwhelmed, how do we regulate those emotions? How do we turn to do those things that help to calm us, to give us a sense of peace and well-being? That will be different for each of us. Let's bring those practices even more into our lives now to build up that bank account of resilience, to help us in our well-being in all ways. It's important not only that we look out for our own resilience and well-being, but that we look out for each other. Dr. Mastin says, we have the capacity of generating a lot of capability to overcome adversity when we coordinate what we do and work together across many different levels. It's not just individuals, but as families, communities, and governments. So what have you seen about ways that people are creatively adapting to their circumstances right now? I wanna share a couple of examples. Things that I thought were, we know that there's things like people looking for ways to create masks for the general populace. There's people that are out there trying to figure out other ways to help the healthcare system. I wanted to give you some fun examples of things that I've also seen that allow us to, to have enjoyable ways to build up that resilience. Now, I don't know whether you saw any of the coverage that in Iran, also a red zone of COVID-19, doctors and nurses individually and in groups participated in what they called a coronavirus dance challenge. You'll have to look for some of these videos of themselves dancing to lively music in hazmat suits. Other medical staff in quarantine serenaded each other or brought instruments to perform for sequestered patients. The other day on CBC radio, I heard of three roommates in Vancouver who went out on their balconies like many of us are these days at seven o'clock, clanging our pots and pans to show our appreciation and support for our healthcare professionals and workers that are out there on the front lines. 
And then at 7.02, they would put a speaker out on their balcony and they had invited all their neighbors to join them in a dance party for about two songs worth. Now they had let their neighbors know ahead of time. They even had one neighbor who lived above them use a fishing rod to lower down their uh, song suggestion for the next night. There was the elderly mother of one of their neighbors who was staying with them, who said to them, it was the highlight every day for her. Jane Shoemaker also sent me a link to a wonderful Facebook video about a family in Australia. Jason then Ginger Darren and his wife Megan, Jenna Darren and his wife Megan have two kids, Art and Evie. Their family also includes Jason's mother, who has Alzheimer's and vascular dementia. For her, having a regular routine is very important. And one of her highlights in her week was to go shopping. Now, of course, she couldn't go out shopping beyond the house, so they set up a shop for her to go grocery shopping in their living room. And then they brought her down, and they, it was a beautiful moment one of those very heart lifting videos to see just how much his mother appreciated what they did and the heart that they brought to it. At the end, they wrote in the video that it's dedicated to families caring for someone less able. Hang in there. I'm sure you also know of stories of things that people are creatively adapting. Those that are fun, those that are serious, those that are thought provoking. I hope you'll share them with each other over email, by phone, if you're on the Beacon Facebook page that you'll share them there. And please also feel free to send them to me by email, minister at beaconunitarian.org, or phone me. If as humans, we can learn and we can be resilient, we also need to focus our actions and words that are grounded in things that we hold as sacred, those values and principles that are important to us as a faith community. The role of religious communities like Beacon is so valuable at a time like this. Joyce Kadaitis shared some words with me by Rav Joseph Kinevsky, who's from the Jewish Orthodox community of Benai David Judea Congregation in Los Angeles. Some of you may have seen some of the words he wrote. Here's the full post. I'd like to take a half a minute to reflect on the religious, human dimensions of this present hour. One of the brand new terms that's entered our daily conversation is social distancing. It's a shortcut, as we well know, for the practical, physical precautions that we all need to take and must do in order to protect ourselves and others. I'd humbly suggest though that we use the term itself sparingly, if at all. Language is a powerful shaper of thinking. And the very last thing that we need right now is a mindset of mutual distancing. We actually need to be thinking in the exact opposite way. Every hand that we don't shake must become a phone call that we make. Every embrace that we avoid must become a verbal expression of warmth and concern. Every inch and every foot that we physically place between ourselves and another must become a thought as to how we can be of help to that other should the need arise. It's obvious that distancing if misplaced or misunderstood, will take its toll, not only upon our community's strength and resilience, but upon the very integrity and meaning of our spiritual commitment. And who knows, he writes, if it was for this time that we have committed ourselves to walk in God's ways. Let's stay safe and let's draw one another closer in a way that we've never done before.